Chapter 15 Karakadran The Slayer Keep I've changed my mind, Felix shouted, eyes closed, knuckles white. I don't want to escape. I'd rather stay and be executed. Godric laughed harshly. They wouldn't execute you, manling. We're not men, after all. They might do the trouser leg ritual on you, but only if they find a big enough pair for a human. The slayer whistled. Would you look at that view? Felix cracked one eye open and immediately wished that he hadn't. Godric was right. It was quite the view. The entirety of the valley that contained Karakadrin spread out below them, obscured from moment to moment by soft clouds. Unable to stop himself, Felix twisted, looking up. It was as if the roof of the world curved above him, but close enough to touch. There was light and then darkness above it, black and cold and empty, save for chill pinpricks of light. He shuddered as his vision swam, and he closed his eyes again as his fingers dug tightly into the rock. When Godric said he planned to escape, Felix had assumed that the Slayer was planning on the direct route, or going via some hidden mechanism known only to the Engineer's Guild. Instead, they were going straight up. The Slayer had turned Felix's cloak into a connecting line, tied it around Felix and then around himself, securing them together. Humiliating as it was, Felix understood the reason for it. There was simply no way that he could have made the climb on his own, not without tools and a good deal of luck. But Gotrek? Gotrek moved like a mountain goat, stubby fingers and toes finding invisible cracks and crevices with unnerving accuracy as he scaled the peak. He stood on the balustrade and led Felix to the side of the balcony, and from there upwards. I used to climb these peaks when I was young, he said, as his breath bloomed in a frosty mist and wafted back over his shoulder. Last one to the summit bought the beer. Charming, Felix said, as the cold dug its talons into his bones. It was far colder at this height than he expected, and he couldn't stop his limbs from shuddering. He blinked, trying to clear the frost from his eyes, and looked at the grimacing face of the ancient dwarf king opposite. He didn't look happy to see them climbing up the cheek of his neighbor, for which Felix couldn't blame him. It must be like watching a fly crawl up the nose of a dinner guest. He chuckled, and then blinked. Gartrek, I think the altitude is getting to me, he said. What? Already? Gartrek said. How much further to the top, Gartrek? Who said anything about the top, Mandling? I thought... Only a few moments more, Mandling, Gotrek said. He turned back to the rock face and began to climb much faster than before. Easy for you to say, Felix muttered. The nudging pain in the shoulder was back and growing stronger. He'd known men who'd dislocated their shoulders before and knew that it could happen again, and easier, now that it'd done it once. He imagined the spasm of another dislocation shooting through his arm, his grip weakening. Could Godric catch him if he fell? Somehow he doubted that. Best not fall then, he breathed. He'd climbed mountains before, but none this high. He tried to concentrate on holding on, on willing his exhausted muscles to work. Ah, right where I remembered it, Godric said. Felix looked up. The bottom of another balcony, much like the one they'd left, stretched out over them. Hold tight, he grunted. Then, before Felix could reply, he swung out from the peak, arms stretching. Felix's gut clenched and the world spun, and then Godric was pulling him up onto another stone balustrade. Felix grabbed the rough stonework and hauled himself over, and collapsed in a puddle on the balcony. Gartrek dropped down beside him, grinning happily. That's it? Felix gasped. We left one balcony for another? Not a balcony, manling, Gartrek pointed, and Felix saw a number of squat machines crouched on the flat stone beyond. 
A landing strip, Gartrek said, heaving himself to his feet. Karakadrin has a number of platforms like this at these heights. Hungrim doesn't have much time for the Engineer's Guild, but he's not so foolish as to deny the use of a few of these dragon pluckers. Felix rubbed his arms, trying to regain feeling in them, as he walked around the machines. He had seen gyrocopters before, but only from a distance. They had a flimsiness about them that seemed at odds with other dwarf war machines, despite the barrel bodies and the heavy rope ladder coiled on the side. On the other was a canvas roll containing a variety of tools, only some of which Felix could glean the purpose of. Gartrek fondly patted the cannon-like object that extended from the front of one of the machines. It's a steam gun, man Ling, he said. Wipe out a horde of charging groby faster than I could spit. Did you ever fly one of these? Felix said. Gartrek's smile slipped from his face. I, he said, a long time ago. His eye narrowed. It's forbidden to any but an engineer to fly one. So you intend to steal one? Steal? Steal? Gotcha glared at him. I'm no thief, he spat. We are simply borrowing it. That implies that we intend to bring it back, Felix said. Besides which, how will we both fit in this thing? It'll barely fit you. We'll improvise something, Gartrek said. He grinned unpleasantly at Felix. Felix stepped away, raising his hands. Oh, no, 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 he said. I've had enough of being carted around like a babe in a sling. It's that, or you stay here, Gartrek growled, shaking a meaty fist. I care not, manling. Felix looked at the gyrocopter, his gut sinking. And then, desperate, he said, What about our weapons? What about your axe? Godric paused. He looked at the door to the landing strip, as if gauging the number of steps, corridors and guards between him and his weapon. And then he shook himself. His hands clenched and unclenched. Plenty of weapons where we're going, manling. He said finally, each word escaping his lips as if dragged by a hook. We're gonna... The door shifted in its frame. Hinges squealed and it swung open. Gartrek stepped forwards, grabbing a heavy spanner from one of the canvas rolls and lifting it. Felix looked around for something to use as a weapon. Gartrek cursed as a shape stepped out onto the balcony. You! He snarled. The World's Edge Mountains, Peak Pass Greater many eyes rode a war altar, held tight by the rusty chains, themselves held tight by magics older and more fell than any he'd ever learned. Demons had forged those chains to bind other demons, and they held him fast. He examined the palms of his clawed gauntlets, meeting the unblinking avian eyes which sprouted bulbously from his palms. Is this my fate, then? Softly he asked, knowing from experience that no answer was forthcoming. The changer had never answered him, even as he served the god on many battlefields, gaining more and more power, his ascent paralleling that of his cousin. He had fought the champions of the changer, the rot, the lover, and even the breaker, wielding first the sword and then magic. He had broken open the black vaults of the Dawizar and fended off their stone-footed sorcerer kings in order to steal the Crystal of Crooked Ways, which he would spend a year and a day carving into the mask he wore now. He made war on the spellbreakers of the Shifting City and on the war judges of the Tamaks. He had corrupted the monks of the White Lotus and had crushed the heart of Isadora von Karstein on the steps of the Lost Cathedral. All of that had been in the service of one goal, the death of his false friend, Garmer. And then, at the Battle of the Blistered Sun, he had the chance. Garmer was there, taking advantage of Dashak Kul's distraction to stage a raid on a rival's camp. The corn worshippers clashed in the ruins of a city that hadn't existed the day before. 
on a screaming, pulsing disc, Grether had skimmed low over the streets, magic crackling between his crooked talons. It had been his whispers which had driven Darjak to war with the Nine Unfulfilled, and given Garmer the opening. So close. He had been so close. He could still taste the bitter ash of the defeat in the back of his throat. He could see the look of recognition in Garmer's eyes, and feel the bite of the Demon Queen's spear as it pierced his side and killed his disc. She had followed him into the dust like a swooping hawk, eyes red alight with untold purpose. The ghost of that spear still haunted him, echoing in his limbs. The changer had seemingly abandoned him then, right in the hands of his enemy. He had been captured, bound, and forced to bind another. Momentarily, his thoughts drifted out, touching the razor-bright hunger of Ulf Grander, the slaughterhound, the massacre that walked. He had a link to it, as the one who bound it to Garmer's soul. It had been his hands which had shaped the eight mystical daggers into its flesh, each blade first dipped in Garmer's blood, but only after it had been beaten and captured by Garmer and his warriors. The creature had been as vicious a combatant as any army of warriors, and a hundred men were butchered on that particular altar of hubris, torn to shreds by Ulf Grander on the Plateau of Sighs, in a battle that raged from the Plateau to the Crater Gates, where demon engines spat fire at the combatants. Garmer had fought Ulf Grander to a standstill, axe carving chunks out of the monster's flesh, armor spattered with the beast's acidic blood, his helm dented from its fangs. And then, Garmer had been almost as monstrous as the slaughterhound in his berserk desire to conquer. That need to dominate had been at the heart of the binding of the creature, for Garmer had become a drift on the tides of blood, mind slipping into a brute hunger like so many of his peers, less a warlord than an engine of murder. Privately, Greta felt some modicum of respect for his cousin in regards to that bit of self-awareness. There weren't many champions of the blood god who could recognize the inherent limits of succumbing to the god's own madness. Most of them dived in quite willingly, but Garmer forced Greter to bind Ulf Grander, the mystic spells allowing Garmer to force his own madness into the beast's already insane skull. This allowed him to be fully clear-headed for the first time in a century, which in turn allowed Garmer to begin his march south. Perhaps that was his fate, he thought. Perhaps he was only a tool, fit only to ensure that Garmer met his own destiny. Grether snarled. Garmer, he thought, chewing the name into shreds. Garmer Kingslayer, Garmer Child Eater, Garmer Tribe Killer. Those were the names the great and powerful Gorewolf was known by in the north. He was not a hero, but a monster. A devil who killed his own people and made a sacrifice of their guts and bones to the blood god. And for what? Greter wondered. He looked around, at the rolling shrines, the galloping steeds and the brutish riders, at the marchers with their bellicose war cries. He sneered at them, although his expression was hidden behind the mask. Garmer was using them as he had used his own tribe. These warriors, these proud brutes, were a collection of sacrifices, waiting to be called when the time was right, all for the glory of corn. You cattle, he shouted. You are all sheep trusting the wolf not to shear you. Through the eyes of his helmet, he saw the diverse fates of everyone he looked at. In most of these, men died. The how and the why was different, but still they died. Every warrior within the sound of his voice was a corpse walking, a maggot farm as yet untilled. True, some survived, some even prospered, rising in the esteem of gods and men, rivaling Garmer in time, but most died. You are all going to die, he said. Quickly, the words chewed up beneath the creak of wheels and the thunder of marching feet and stomping hooves. Even me, he continued, settling back. Just like them, Greta had a choice of deaths, ranging from the shameful to the staggering. In one future, Garmer simply tore his head off his shoulders once his purpose was fulfilled. In another, Greta died in the jaws of the slaughterhound. In a third, 
he set his talons in his cousin's throat and they died together. That last one warmed his heart, and it was the only reason he hadn't yet attempted a futile and fatal escape. What is the first thing we were taught as children, cousin? Garmer said. Gretter turned as the warlord brought his night-black steed in line with the creaking altar, the animal's hooves trotting in rhythm with the cloven paws of the two gore beasts pulling the thing. Well, Garmer said. Gretter looked away. The changer lies, cousin. That is what we were taught. What all of us, all of them, were taught. Garmer continued. Whatever his name, the step wolf speaks with a forked tongue. The spider queen spins webs from daydreams, and the ravenkin speaks in riddles that can trap the unwary. Only in blood there is truth. They know better than to listen to you, these brave warriors. Self-righteousness has always been the weapon you are most comfortable with, cousin, Greta said, turning. In his eyes, a kaleidoscope of swirling fates swan and duel for Garmer. Blood is blood, nothing more, nothing less. Do you really expect to find fertile soil for your poison? Garmer said. And what poison would that be? I see it, cousin, winding its way in among the red currents of my followers, Garmer said. Perhaps I should have cut out your tongue. And then who would have told you your fortunes? Garmer grunted and chuckled. True enough, cousin, he said. Greta hated that laugh. He hated Garmer. Ekaterina will betray you, he said. And so, Garmer said, shrugging. The armor rustled. We all strive for the gods, cousin, even you. Kanto does not, Greta said. Kanto has his own uses, Garmer said. Even as I do, Greta said. Our path is littered with blood and bones, cousin, Garmer said. I have shred the blood of demons and men from the waste all the way to here. The road trembles in eagerness. It yearns for completion. He hesitated then. Greta knew what question was coming even before it came out of Garmer's lips. It was always the same question. Is he coming? For such a mighty warrior, you require quite a lot in the way of reassurance, Greta said. Tell me, Garmer said. He wasn't quite pleading, not quite, nor was he demanding. Here, at this point, in this place, on this path of fate, jailer and prisoner were equal. They were only cousins again, boys who had grown together, becoming warriors, serving the tribe together, fighting enemies back to back. Greta saw the past as clearly as all those possible futures, and saw blood on the snow as he and Garmer, lean and sun-hardened, had roved like wolves among the enemies of the tribe, axes and swords in hand. They had served no gods save ambition, sword brothers, bloodkin, and now, what? How did we come to this? Greta said. Garmer stared at him silently. With a start, Greta realized that he hadn't seen his cousin's face in more than a century, nor had he seen his own. Both of them were trapped behind a mask, locked into the cycles of destiny. He sighed, anger fading to a dull lake as he tried to pry one future from a web of dozens. He is coming. They will meet us at a peak pass, where we destroy the others. Garmer shuddered in his armor. It will be complete then. I will have my reward, he said, like a child eager for a sweet meat. Oh, yes, Greta said, and bowed his head. Karakadrin, the Slayer Keep Yes, me. Axon said, 
gesturing to Godric with what Felix realized was the Slayer's axe. And that wasn't all. The priest also had Karagul's hilt peeking over one shoulder. Take your axe, Slayer. There's work yet to be done. What are you talking about? Gotra growled, not quite loading the spanner, as Axon shoved the door closed. Have you come to try to talk us out of leaving, priest? Where would be the sense in that, Gurnison? Would you be swayed by words, sweet or otherwise? Axon said, holding out Gotrek's weapon, balanced across his palms. You can take it. Gotrek did so, snatching the weapon and bringing it close. He ran a thumb along the blade and then stuffed the bleeding digit into his mouth. Axon unstrapped Felix's own sword belt and tossed Karagul to its astonished owner. Why are you doing this? Felix said, partially sliding Karagul from its sheath. He hadn't realized how much he missed the blade until he had been reunited with it. You were the one who convinced Ungrim not to let us go to begin with. Did I? Axon said. I merely told Ungrim that if Gurnison marched with the throng, Karakadrin would fall. You are not with the throng, and I believe you don't intend to march. He gestured at the gyrocopters. The prophecy doesn't cover flying, swimming, or falling. If you're a man, I would accuse you of sophistry, Felix said. Axon grunted. If I were a man, we wouldn't be having this conversation. He looked at Felix. I knew Gurnison wouldn't be content in captivity, even as I knew he wouldn't seek to fight his way out. Not even a slayer would shed dwarf blood so lightly or selfishly. That left only two options. That still doesn't explain how you knew, Felix said. Grimnir told me, Axon said, shrugging. But why help us, Felix said, strapping Karagul to his waist, even as he wondered what the last bit meant. Why bring us our weapons? Prophecies are funny things, human, especially when they are at a cross-purpose, Axon said. Speak plainly, priest, Gotra grunted. Your doom is not today, Gurnison, or even tomorrow or a year from now, Axon said, glancing at the door. Despite the wind, Felix heard a faint noise. They were horns, he thought. But there is a doom out there, and it is hungry for you, and if it takes you, we will all die with you. But if Godric is fated to die elsewhere, Felix began. Chaos makes mockeries of all prophecy important, even its own. What is immutable becomes mutable when the winds of chaos blow, Axon said. Gotrek nodded grudgingly. Aye, mountains become water and the truth becomes a lie, Gotrek muttered. And then, you play dice with the gods, boy, he said to Axon. Then you had best see to it that we win, Gurnison, Axon said. Now, take to the air. Garagrim noticed your absence and sounded the alarm. What is going to happen if he catches us? Felix said nervously. Best see to it that he doesn't, eh? Axon said, clapping him on the arm in a friendly manner. Keep him fighting, Jaeger, he added, this one more softly. Because of the prophecy, Felix said. Axon hesitated and then nodded jerkily. The door shuddered in his frame. Somebody was trying to open it. Axon fairly flew across the distance and planted one broad shoulder against the door. Time is up. You must go. Get on, manling. Gotrek said, 
climbing into the bucket seat of the gyrocopter. He grabbed a pair of goggles and strapped them above his head before tossing a pair to Felix. Wrap that cloak tight about yourself. It's gonna get cold. Concerned about my health now? If you freeze to death, I'm gonna need a new remembrancer, Gotcha grunted, flipping switches and pulling levers. Give the rotor a push, and then get on. Where, out of curiosity? Gotrek pointed. While Felix had been talking to Axon, Gotrek had stretched a heavy roll of canvas out beneath the landing struts of the gyrocopter, creating an improvised hammock. Felix stared at it, aghast. Gotrek growled impatiently. Manling, we use these to carry rocks three times your weight. It's secure enough. Now give the blasted rotor a shove. Felix did so, straining against the resistance of the rotor. Even with both arms, it took a few tries. When he finally got it moving, it rotated slowly in an almost desultory fashion. Gotrek pumped a lever, and the speed picked up. Felix slid beneath the gyrocopter and into the sling, even as the struts left the stone, bouncing slightly and knocking the air out of him. He reached out, grabbing the struts. Any time, Gotrek, he said. Behind them, metal rang on metal. Felix twisted, looking back over his shoulder. Axon had his back pressed against the door, and there was a look of strain on his face. He wouldn't be able to hold on the door much longer. The gyrocopter bounced again, and then shot upwards in a plume of dust. Felix coughed and spat and pulled the goggles over his eyes. His entire body shook as the gyrocopter took off, and he gritted his teeth as they rattled in his head. He heard Gotrek laughing as the rotors chopped the air, and then the comforting solidity of the stones of Karakadrin dropped away and they were in the air. Felix thought he might have screamed, but he was uncertain. The human screams loudly, one of the guards said, shading his eyes to watch the departing gyrocopter as it bounced in the air. Maybe it was a war cry. Very big on war cries, these humans, another one said. Quiet, both of you, Garagrim growled, casting a glare at the two iron breakers. Somebody get a representative of the Engineers Guild up here, and pilots, he snarled. Then he transferred the glare to the priest on the ground. Axon had been knocked aside by the forcing open of the eerie door, and he sat up, rubbing at his shoulder. Well, what do you have to say for yourself, priest? Uh, you're welcome, Axon said, heaving himself to his feet. Garagrim raised a fist, but refrained from striking the priest. He couldn't say exactly what stayed his hand. Maybe it was tradition or honor, perhaps. Or maybe fear. Traitor or not, Axon was still a priest still beloved of the gods. Or maybe he simply couldn't bring himself to strike a fellow dwarf. Despite what the others were saying about him, Garagrim was not as hot-headed or pig-blind as he acted. He had merely taken on the role of a slayer, and played it to the best of his ability. But he could think when he needed to. You let them go. No, you helped them escape, Garagrim said. It wasn't a question, although Axon answered as if it was one. Indeed I did, Axon said, straightening his robe. If Ungrim had simply listened to me, none of this would have been necessary. He met the war mourner's glare. But he didn't. The question now is, will you? What do you mean? Garagrim said, momentarily taken aback. You were intending to pursue Gurnison, weren't you? Garagrim hesitated, eyes narrowed. Are you going to tell me I shouldn't? Actually, I was going to tell you you should, Axon said. You must muster a second throng and... It doesn't matter, Garagrim interjected. 
I don't plan on listening to you either way. You have played us false, priest, and I... We'll stop bellowing, Queen Kema said, sweeping out onto the balcony, flanked by her guards. The ironbreakers and the clansmen traded glares as Kema looked around and made a tut-tut sound. I knew he went too quickly, she murmured. You expected this, Garagrim said, looking at his mother in shock. Of course, she said. As did you, my son. It was Axon's turn to look startled. What? The sewers, Garagrim grunted. I suspected Gurnison would try to escape, but I thought he'd go the same way he did before, not up. I've had warriors stationed there for days now. Unhappy warriors, I might add, Kema said. She ran her fingers across the edge of a rotor. But how would you have... Axon began. Garagrim hiked a thumb at the balustrade. The storm flues, priest. They lead in and out of the mountain. It is how Gurnison escaped the last time my father tried to imprison him. He frowned. Apparently he rode down them during a storm like a log on a flume. He shook his head. He was as mad then as he is now. And let us pray that he is as successful this time as he was back then, Kema said. Regardless, you will do nothing to the priest. She looked at her son. The priest was acting at my orders. He was? Garagrim said. I was? Axon said. He was, Kema said, folding her hands into her sleeves. I will take full responsibility for this debacle. Let Ungrim break his fangs on my walls if he wants, if, when, he returns. She pointed at Garagrim. Marshal a second frong of half of the warriors that remain, you will march out as soon as possible. Me? But father said... Garagrim began, even as a savage joy filled him. Do not pretend to be stupid, my son, Kema said harshly. There is more at stake than your father's honor or ours. Our people must be preserved. She swung around, her gaze capturing the huffing representative of the Engineers Guild as he stepped out onto the balcony, mouth open to bellow about impropriety. By long tradition, the Eries, set aside for gyrocopters, were forbidden to anyone save guild members. Master Flinthand, Kema said. I need those devices of yours in the air within the hour. Scour the mountains in all directions. A storm is coming, and I would know when it is drawing close. Garagrim watched his mother bully the engineer into shock silence and smiled. He hoped Gurnison would escape and give him cause to pursue. Indeed, he had been going to see Gurnison to propose just that. Despite their mutual dislike, he'd been certain that the other slayer would take him up on his offer. This way was better. This way, there was no guilt for disobeying his father, for helping Gurnison, for any of it. The war mourner's palms itch for the feel of his axe's hafts. A slayer would die. That had been the prophecy. And that slayer was gonna be him, even if he had to hamstring Gurnison to do it. 